Hello and welcome to Eccentric Earth, the podcast where I'm joined every week by a special guest as we go through some of the strange, weird and forgotten stories of history. As always, I'm your host Amy Walker and joining me for this episode we have Pete Gaskell. Hello, hello indeed. Thank you for having me on. No, no, thank you for thank you for coming on. I've been on enough of your shows. It's about time I got you on one of mine again. Yes, I've missed it. I've missed the opportunity to uh, not do the hosting stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got the easy job this time. I'm the one who does all the talking, so... <laughs> uh, that's what you think. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so are you ready to learn something about some weird history? Oh, yes. Okay, so let's get started. Yes, that's indeed. After the end of World War I, many of Australia's returning soldiers chose to become farmers, moving to Western Australia's marginal areas for work, along with a number of British servicemen who chose to make a new life for themselves in Australia. Mm. Things went well for the farmers until 1929, when the Wall Street crash occurred. Due to the crash, many countries suffered from economic depression. Australia was no exception. The country suffered from years of high unemployment levels, plunging incomes and lack of economic growth. Following the crash, farmers were encouraged to increase their wheat crops, with the government promising and failing to deliver assistance in the form of subsidies. In spite of the recommendations and the promised subsidies, wheat prices continued to fall, and by October 1932, matters were becoming intense, with farmers preparing to harvest the season's crop while simultaneously threatening to refuse to load the wheat. Before a resolution to this could be reached, Things were complicated with the arrival of 20,000 emus. Right. Emus regularly migrate across large areas of Western Australia after their breeding season, heading to the coast from the inland regions. Due to farmers having cleared large areas of land and having increased water supplies for their livestock, the emus found that the cultivated lands were a good habitat. The emus began to foray into the farmers' territory, in particular the marginal farming land around Chandler and Walgalam. I apologise to Australian listeners. <laughs> Can you have slightly less vowels in your names from the future? <laughs> <laughs> the emus descended on the farmland, consuming as much of the crop as they could and leaving what they did not eat useless to the farmers. The emus were not the only concern to the farmers at the time. Thanks to the emus breaking through barriers and fences, the crops also fell victim to other pests such as rabbits. Oh, oh Yes. Just as a slight aside, rabbits aren't native to Australia, are they? They were just brought over to um, pest control, I think, and then they just bred because apparently that's what rabbits do, which is why they became a bit of an infestation. Infestation doesn't sound right for rabbits, does it? (laughs) Yeah, um, they're brought over by the first European settlers, partially as pets and partially to to eat. But yeah, like, like rabbits all do, they just bred and bred and... Suddenly there's more rabbits than anything else. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry. This is this is an aside. I just, I just bought off there and I was like, oh yeah. yeah no, no, no that, that, that's that's what your role's for you to jump in with asides and comments and questions. Good. <laughs> with the crops being destroyed and the emus continuing their advance, a number of farmers were selected to meet with Sir George Pierce, the Australian Minister of Defence. Do you think that for the Minister of Defence, it's a bit underwhelming that they've got to find a way to defend the homeland against emus? You only think they'd find slightly better use for the military budget? (laughs) Uh, You just wait until you find out what their reaction's going to (laughs) be. I should have to think. Go on. (laughs) Due to many of the farmers being veterans of World War I, they were well aware of the effectiveness of machine guns, and they requested that the weapons be deployed to deal with the problem. Machine guns? 
That's yes. that is definitely bringing a gun to a knife fight. <laughs> bringing out machine guns to fight emus with. The minister agreed, although with a number of conditions attached. The guns were to only be used by military personnel, and troop transport was to be financed by Western Australian government. However, the farmers would provide food and accommodation for the soldiers, and they would have to pay for all of the ammunition. Okay. The government also supported the deployment of military personnel on the grounds that the birds would make good target practice for their soldiers, although it had also been argued that some in the government may have viewed this as a way of being seen to be helping Western Australian farmers. How are emus target practice for war? Because emus do things that men can't. But they also move, which regular targets don't, so... Yeah. Can I guess emus it's... fly or are they one of the flightless ones? Because I'm going to say, if they fly, then that is something <laughs> definitely <laughs> that humans can't do. No, they are the flightless ones. I suppose they could yeah. strap lots of human-sized targets to the emus and have them run around... Essentially, have dummies on them just to yeah. do target practice. <laughs> in case, in case they are ever attacked by people who come in riding emus. <laughs> yes, <laughs> which is a notorious problem. <laughs> okay, the emu on sort. Did he actually go through with this? Oh yes. <laughs> In order to try and show that they were helping farmers in Australia, the government assigned a cinematographer to document events. Right. <laughs> so they're going to make a big thing of this. Is this going to be sort of Pafé news footage? Right. Look at our brave... Oh, sorry, I have to put on an accent. Look at our brave Australian fellas. Bravely, manly, fighting our fees, flaming go I muse. It's not been a good day for them. That sort of thing. That was intentionally an accent. I'm sorry if it's terrible i think i've offended i've offended the australian fan base more than you have there, <laughs> move on <laughs> well there is some quite similar news footage i found that is going to be edited into the show so you're not too far off <laughs> <laughs> well hopefully they won't tell the difference these are some of the unfortunate farmers whose sweet crops have been trampled down by hordes of emus, but they're hopeful of getting rid of the pest at last. They've never used this sort of scarifier before, but things are desperate, and it's war to a finish this time. The scouts of the advancing army have keen eyesight, and in order to get close to the main body, our lads have to do some real stalking, with the enemy watching events through their periscopes, raised up over the heads of corn. Now they're retiring, off at 40 miles an hour. Well, instead of the birds ruining the farmers, it seems the tables are turned, and there'll be no more damage done here for many a day to come. The Minister of Defence, George Pearce, said that those who don't live with the emus couldn't understand the damage they did as a way of justifying the military involvement. OK. Military action was due to begin on, in October 1932. The operation was conducted under the command of Major G.P.W. Meredith of the 7th Heavy Battery of the Royal Australian Artillery. Artillery? Yes. Artillery is those great big big Bertha-style guns as well. So... <laughs> this is ridiculous. Carry on. Meredith would command two soldiers, Sergeant S. McMurray and Gunner J. O'Halloran, armed with two Lewis automatic machine guns and 10,000 rounds of ammunition. The operation was delayed, however, by a period of rainfall that caused the emus to scatter over a wider area. The rain ceased by 2nd of November 1932, at which point the troops were deployed with orders to assist the farmers and, according to a newspaper account, to collect 100 emu skins so that their feathers could be used to make hats for light horsemen. <laughs> so now he's just become a trophy. <laughs> well, if you're going to kill them, you might as well recycle. <laughs> Which it could, it could well have just been from the beginning, just with <laughs> military funding. <laughs> when the people of Australia heard what was planned, they protested it. Senator James Guthrie led the fight against Pierce's plan, which the press quickly named the Emu War. <laughs> Guthrie said it was unnecessary cruelty. If the emu had to go, he argued, 
then it should be done through more humane, if less spectacular methods. I think there's some there's a slight element of truth to that, <laughs> but I'm now concerned what the humane methods might be. And machine guns not humane? Um, for the person operating them, potentially, not for anything else. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm just concerned. I'm just thinking something slightly less humane, like a bayonet charge or something. <laughs> Give them a chance, you know. <laughs> charge of a flight brigade. Sorry. <clears throat> George Pierce bit back, telling Guthrie, it's no more cruel to kill a bird with a machine gun than with rifles. But the cities weren't convinced. Over the next few days, papers on the East Coast were filled with think pieces, calling it a brutal form of mass slaughter. See, I, I don't think it's a type of firearm that is being debated as to which as to, as to levels of severity being deployed somehow in a way you can kind of see pierce's point like if you're going to go out and shoot them with a rifle you're still shooting them yeah i don't think they want them shot at all <laughs> is kind of a point we're trying to make they are doing a lot of damage though that's that's the thing you know it's it's one of those things it's like should you go out and mass kill animals it is it is a gun to a knife fight it's a machine gun to a knife fight that's what it is <laughs> can you like set, you know scare scare emus i don't know is there such a thing or fences of some kind something slightly more manageable than but it's just reenact the song with emus <laughs> <laughs> well maybe maybe they're gonna agree with you and this story will uh fizzle out into they just built big fences ah there you go emu proof fence didn't they do that with rabbits and it didn't work because the rabbits chewed through the fence yeah and i believe they did try it with the emus but when twenty thousand of them are all going in the same direction they're going to break through like a stampede. fence <laughs> yeah. hmm. so it's in that sort of numbers then it's thousands mm. Mm. so mm. they don't even have enough bullets to take all of them out if they manage to kill one per bullet i suppose I don't know why I'm going down this direction, but I suppose in that sense, a machine gun's more effective than a rifle, because you won't need to reload. Yeah. Plus, by the time you've shot one, the rest will have run off. That's not a particular area I wanted to go down, but it just makes some sort of sense now. So let's move on before, before I go completely <laughs> off the deep end, apparently. <laughs> let's try to justify this madness. On the 2nd of November, the soldiers travelled to Campion, where some 50 emus were sighted. As the birds were out of range of the guns, the local settlers attempted to herd the emus into an ambush, but the birds split into smaller groups and ran so that they were difficult to target. Whilst the first volley from the machine guns was ineffective due to the range, a second round of gunfire was able to kill a number of the birds. Later the same day, a small flock was encountered and close to a dozen birds were killed. Wow. So did that mean that they adjusted their tactic? I mean, not. I mean, the emus, if they were aware enough to just go... No. Yes. Um, there's a quote here from uh, one newspaper that says, The EMU command has evidently ordered guerrilla tactics. <laughs> that is a wonderful line. <laughs> particularly, particularly good if they misspelt gorilla as well to be G O R I W L A. <laughs> they reported that. The emus were smarter than anyone had imagined. The animals knew that hunting season had begun and they were adapting. Quite know what this says about Australian military prowess. If <laughs> <laughs> being outsmarted by emus. <laughs> Each pack seems to have a leader now, one soldier reported. Big black plumed bird which stands fully six feet high and keeps watch while his mates carry out the work of destruction and warns them of our approach. So they've got sentries <laughs> on, on patrol. <laughs> That sounds like them being thick, missing the targets, and then trying to justify it by saying that... <laughs> Do not underestimate the intelligence of emus, particularly when they form an army. <laughs> we didn't do anything wrong, it's the emus, I swear. Yes. <laughs> it's that leader, he's a cunning general. <laughs> the next significant event was on the 4th of November. Meredith had established an ambush near a local dam, and more than 1,000 emus were spotted heading towards their position. This time, the gunners waited until the birds were in close proximity before opening fire. The guns jammed after only 12 birds were killed, and the remainder scattered before any more could be killed. No more birds were sighted that day. <laughs> this is ridiculous, isn't it? <laughs> oh yeah. In the days that followed, 
Meredith chose to move further south, where the birds were reported to be fairly tame, but they were only limited success in spite of his efforts. This is this is Pony to the Apes, just <laughs> earlier, of the emus. And starring emus. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure one of these leaders must be played by Andy Serkis. <laughs> At one stage, Meredith even went so far as to mount one of the guns on a truck, a move that proved to be ineffective as the truck was unable to gain on the birds, and the ride was so rough that the gunner was unable to fire any shots. By the 8th of November, six days after the first engagement with the emus, two and a half thousand rounds of ammunition had been fired. Fifty birds had been killed. So out of two and a half thousand bullets, fifty hit the target. (laughs) Yeah. And in the same report, Meredith noted that none of his men had suffered casualties. <laughs> well, uh, considering so he gave a hand-to-hand skirmish <laughs> with the emus, I'm not surprised. Unless these emus suddenly started picking up the foreign rifles of the men and started firing back. <laughs> Don't tell me that happens now. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? It, it could get weirder. I have no doubt it does. <laughs> The machine gunner's dream of point-blank fire into masses of emus was soon dissipated. The emu command had evidently ordered guerrilla tactics, and its unwieldy army soon split up into innumerable smaller units that made use of the military equipment's uneconomic use. A crestfalling field force therefore withdrew from the combat area after a month. Can I just add, is he trying to imply that a bunch of emus were smarter than all the commanders in World War I? <laughs> um yes <laughs> <laughs> okay carry on <laughs> on the 8th of november representatives in the australian house of representatives discussed the operation following the negative coverage of the events in the local media that included claims that only a few emus had died george pierce withdrew the military personnel and guns I suppose that's the best. (laughs) (laughs) After the withdrawal, Major Meredith compared the emus to Zulus and commented on the striking manoeuvrability of the emus, even whilst badly wounded. You can't fight, you can't try and justify your ineptitude (laughs) by saying that that, that, that emus have got tactics, (laughs) because they don't. (laughs) They just don't fly into bullets, or run into bullets. Machine guns mounted on like a swivelly thing, anyway. Yes. So you can sort of. This is this is my intense military knowledge right now. Aren't machine guns like, mounted like a swivelly thing? That means you can sweep from the left to the right. So no matter which direction they run in, you should still be able to fire. In theory, yes. So that, <laughs> if they were on one of those, which you presume they would be, whether or not mounted on a bumpy, bumpy Land Rover or breaking down then we should not have had this issue. Because I doubt that emus would duck for cover and sort of like quietly stealthily move from bush to bush. In the bush, so to speak. (laughs) I don't know. This this is is just, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) One of the the, the biggest issues they faced was took a lot more bullets than they thought to kill an emu. How tough is an emu's height? I don't know. It's feathers, isn't it? It's a bird. There's a lot of muscle in there as well. Yeah. I suppose because you do run <laughs> like the crappers, don't they? Because you do yeah. race emus now, don't they, in Australia? They've got good chunky thighs on them. So, yeah, I suppose we've got, yeah, plenty of muscle behind them thinking about it. Yeah. Just headshots. Presumably we don't have muscle there. <laughs> tiny heads, though. <laughs> Compared yes, to but... the rest of the bird, tiny heads. Yeah, but... Machine guns. <laughs> <laughs> Presumably a stray one would somehow find its way through. You'd go for a lot of bullets, though. Well, they went through a lot of bullets anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Look, you're making very valid points. I can't keep going against them. Well, yeah, you're not an Australian general in between the wars, are you? <laughs> <laughs> Speaking about the toughness of the emus, Major Meredith did say... If we had a military division with the bullet-carrying capacity of these birds, it would face any army in the world. They can face machine guns with the invulnerability of tanks. This is going weird. Now this guy was <laughs> wanting to talk frost-breeding human emu program. <laughs> Dear. 
apparently the ultimate soldier. <laughs> I think I think I think it's got to him a bit this, hasn't it? <laughs> the official order was given to withdraw. However, Major Meredith didn't stand down. When Pierce gave the orders to come back, he kept fighting. Meredith and his two gunners stayed, patrolling the fences and shooting every emu they saw. Sort of like sort of like Elmer Fudd, basically. Yeah, he's got a bit apocalypse now now. <laughs> it's a vendetta. <laughs> Oh, they need to, to do this as like Apocalypse Now, but with emus. Yes. He's the rogue commander. Oh, Moby he's Dick. There. <laughs> yeah. He's after the white emu. Yes. <laughs> oh, wow. Yep. The settlers were upset with the withdrawal. If Pierce wouldn't support them, they needed a new champion. And they found one in Labour Party secretary, George Lambert. A farmer yeah. sent Lambert a telegram. Gunners withdrawn. Imperative they should stay. Emus beginning to reappear in large numbers, it read. Can you do anything? Lambert was the right man to call. He rallied against his fellow politicians for dropping out of the emu war, and he didn't mince his words. It's all very well for the city pussyfoots in the House of Representatives to make little of the attempt to eradicate emus with machine guns, but the farmers, he told them, don't think it was so funny. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I beg to differ, but you know, I'm not a, a farmer <laughs> getting pestered by emus and madmen. So, <laughs> continue. Major Meredith and the Premier of Western Australia backed Lambert up. The emu war was working, they insisted, and they were going to keep fighting, whether the people in the cities liked it or not. This has got some eerie parallels with Vietnam, hasn't it? <laughs> it's fine, it's fine, we're winning this war, we'll just keep on throwing men and technology at it and eventually we'll be fine. <laughs> Don't tell me the emus develop some sort of very deep network of tunnels. Although at this point it won't surprise me in all honesty. You're going to say exactly that though, aren't you? On December 1st, the tunnels were discovered. No, that's the just joke. <laughs> <laughs> Although it would not surprise me. A report that indicated that 300 emus had been killed in the initial operation, more than initially believed, also helped to change the views on the emu war. George Pierce reapproved the emu war on November 11th. Such strong representations have been made to me, he announced, that I have approved of the machine gun party returning to the wheat belt to destroy thousands of emus, which are causing tremendous damage to crops. The emu war turned. The Emu War, part two. <laughs> <laughs> Emu harder. Meredith was once again placed in the field due to an apparent lack of experienced machine gunners in the state. He and his men had learned from their initial mistakes, however. On the first day alone, they took out 300 emus, more than they'd killed in their first attempts altogether. As the battle dragged on, the emus grew more careful, but the militia still managed to kill an average of 100 emus a week. The Emu War was going so well that other farmers were begging for militia help. People in other areas soon called George Lambert as well, telling him that they had emu problems of their own and that they wanted Meredith and his men. Wow. He's suddenly in demand. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> emu busters. By the time Meredith returned home, he and his men had killed an estimated 3,500 emus. By then, though, the city papers had run out of emu jokes and lost interest. <laughs> <laughs> oh no it's five minutes of fame a single paper reported on the end of the war burying it in the country news section farmers now breathe again it reported the emus are too scared to go anywhere near the farms and the crops were thriving major meredith and his gun crew the paper said are to be congratulated Woo. the emus didn't stay away forever three years later the country was hit by another drought the emus came back no, <laughs> emus with a vengeance. <laughs> the farmers wanted another emu war, but the government wasn't about to go down that road again. By now, the story had spread around the world. Australia had been turned into a laughing stock, and they didn't want to make it any worse than it already was. Instead, okay. they, stayed, they started a beak bonus system. The government put a bounty on every beak torn from the corpse of a dead emu. It worked much better. In the first two months alone, 13,000 emus died, and by the end of the first year, 30,000 beaks were claimed. By the 50s, Australia set up a 135-mile-long emu-proof fence, and the days of the emu raids came to an end. So just as a comparison, the military, with machine guns, managed to take down 3,500 emus. Farmers, on their own, took down 13,000. 
how do they manage it? <laughs> I I don't know. Aiming at the emus, probably. I <laughs> Potentially. You see, you, now you've brought up the idea of you know it's about the beaks. I just have an image of them sort of like manfully wrestling them in sort of like <laughs> mano y mano combat. It's like nose versus beak. Like whoever pulls this off wins. Wins. A, wins. A, oh, it's a kind of face. Wins. A, wins a fight. <laughs> Let's go very Crocodile Dundee. You call that yeah. a knife? <laughs> to be fair, if you're Australians, it would not surprise. <laughs> Guys with uh, emu beak necklaces. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds quite sad, though. Because it hasn't that sort of like, damaged the emu population consistently, though, because they are still around. Yeah, there's still masses of emus. They're just um... lots and lots of them. But now, not... not... <laughs> We're not, we're, not, we're not forming armies anymore. We're, we're trying to wave off our land and be peaceful. Yeah, there's, a, there's an uneasy truce between the two species. <laughs> At least until Woody Harrelson shows up. Um. <laughs> the farmers in the West didn't forget the emu war. Up until the fence was built, they called the militia every time the emus created the problem. To the world, Major Meredith and his men were a joke. But to these farmers, they were the men who had saved their lives. The men who had fought in the emu war. So was he a hero then? <laughs> he was to the farmers. I don't know if that makes him a hero for machine gunning emus. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's very much a big fish in a ridiculously small emu infested pond. <laughs> <laughs> it's an insane topic. Were they? Somebody I just, just considered now because in the dates. While the rest of the world was going through World War Two, is this guy just casually machine gunning emus? <laughs> like there's nothing better for him to utilize his skills. Because, like you know, fighting in the Pacific War, he's like, nah, don't mind me, mate. I'm busy just blowing these beaks off. Either that, or when he was deployed overseas, he just replaced everyone he saw with emus. Is that... He saw emus charging yeah. at him. And that was the is only that... way he could get through it. <laughs> just imagine this like unit of like <laughs> American soldiers, island hopping during World War Two, and they have this sort of Australian task force led by this guy, Miss Meredith, and while the Americans are just you know fighting the Japanese or whoever in, in, in the uh, in the war, and this guy's just blowing up birds that he's seeing. Like, what are you doing? He says, "You can't be too careful." <laughs> Shooting every <laughs> pigeon that comes past. <laughs> yeah. Is that... You deal with those, I'll deal with the flappy things. That's what I can aim for. <laughs> I <have> prior practice. <laughs> sort of the stuff you'd see on Dad's army. But actually, this is the sort of thing I could actually picture Mannering Ectow doing. I'm sure he did <laughs> in some variation. I think we saw like fought turkeys or something in an episode of Dad's army. It does seem like the sort of thing they would do. It's the sort of thing that if you saw it on a sitcom like that, you'd say, this is too ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> but it's true. Nothing yeah. is more ridiculous than history. As you kind of prove over the course <laughs> of this podcast. I'm just intrigued now to see if there are any other conflicts, I use that term very loosely, involving humans versus a non-human species. Has this had any precedent before um i'm just having a quick look now like humans with in war with animals but the only thing that is coming up is the emu war there's Funny lots of that. who would win in a fight questions but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think this is the only time we've really gone up against nature and struggled kind of lost <laughs> <laughs> man voice struggled i love it though when, it, when i heard about this story i was like this has got to be this is just, made yeah. up, but no, it's it's a hundred percent true. I'd like to know if any Australian listeners know of this, whether it's a sort of a a talismanic moment in their history, <laughs> sort of like we have awkward moments in British history that we'd rather forget. So, so most of British history, basically, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> whether this has sort of gone down in your, whether you're taught about it in Australian schools and go, uh, kids, never drink and shoot an emu. <laughs> Just, I don't know. It's... Yeah, if we have any Australian listeners, please email us, tweet us, contact us on Facebook. Let us know if this is something that is is taught in Australian schools, and in what way is it a national shame, or is it something 
of immense pride. I'd be really interested to find out. I'm going to say it leans more towards the shame. <laughs> Although I suppose it depends where. Because I presume in the, sort of the farming communities of Western Australia, this might be I sort of like, what kids, this is what our brave boys did. They'll show the Pathé news footage and right, be there beaming with pride. So, yeah. If it ever happens again, you know who to call. <laughs> Major Meredith. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I'd love it if his if his emu vehicle, the one he mounted a machine gun in, was a sort of a converted hearse. Like Ecto <laughs> one. Like Emu one. <laughs> converted telegraph station as his own base. <laughs> wow. I think you have to you have to um, do an emu version of Ghostbusters to end this on. I think, Amy. In all honesty, <laughs> I am I am mightily impressed with your story. Uh, I really am. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought I'd give you a crazy one because I know you 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 like the weird stuff. Whatever gave you that idea? <laughs> <laughs> the weirder the better. <laughs> the weirder the better. <laughs> and this is most definitely that. So, um, if people enjoyed listening to this and liked hearing you, where where can they find you elsewhere on the internet? Where they can find me? Um, Well, I'm Peter Gaskell, and I am... Basically, I am Smorgasbord. Um, Smorgasbord, S-M-O-R-G-A-S-B-O-R-E-D. I went to me a long time to when I just spell that by the way. Um, Smorgasbord. We do plenty of different podcasts. We'll be doing more as we go into the new year. But our main show is a daily, daily show that covers weird news of the day, which is presumably why Amy was so gracious as to invite me onto this show because she knows how much I like her. I like the weird, the wacky, and the wonderful. We um, we do weird news. We play silly games. There's going to be plenty more. Um, I don't know when this is going to be airing, but... Uh, Monday. Monday. Oh, excellent. Um, then, hopefully, Smugglesport will be back for the new year. Um, there we, we do have a number of sideline shows as well, which I am um, cautious about talking about because they will be revealed over time. Uh, we do have one that's a, a spin-off based on Doctor Who as well, so if you're a Doctor Who fan, um, dig into that. Um, Amy herself has been um, a, a, a very well-regarded guest on the Smorgasbord, and I hope you'll continue to be in future. Um, and you can find yeah, us of course. basically at iTunes, Stitcher, Acast. Rate, review, subscribe. Give us a five stars for you if you so wish. It will be greatly, greatly appreciated. And uh, if you want to contact me for whatever reason you, uh, ever you like the show, you, you, you like my sort of voice, or you uh, you just want to um, chat about weird news and stuff, I'm always willing to. And you can um, follow me on Twitter at Smogsport Pod, uh, on Instagram also at Smogsport Pod, or you can email me at Smogsport Pod at gmail dot com. And I think that's enough showing for me, uh, Amy. Back to you. Thank you, Pete. If people want to follow us here at Eccentric Earth, they can on Twitter by going to at eccentric underscore earth. We have a Facebook page, which you can find by searching for at eccentric earth. And we're on Instagram too. We update all of our social media accounts every single day with updates about the show and upcoming episodes, as well as fun facts about what happened on those days throughout history. If you like the show, you can find us on all major podcast subscribers, such as iTunes, Acast, Podcast Addict, Podbean, and many others. So please make sure that you subscribe so that you can always catch our new episodes that come out every single Monday. You can also leave us a review if you enjoyed the show over on iTunes, which helps us to stand out and to find new listeners. If you want to get in contact with us to ask us any questions or to make suggestions for future topics to be covered, our email address is eccentricearth at outlook.com. So thank you again, everybody, for taking time to listen to us. And thank you, Pete, for joining me. Thank you for um, thank you for inviting me on. Thank you for educating me in the wild world of weird Western Australians. Um, <laughs> I'll certainly be discussing this in the pub later. Goodbye. <laughs>